Welcome, fans, of the MMA Discussion Podcast, brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Uh, we're brought to you also by our sponsor, SubmissionFC.com. Uh, Get 10% off by adding his promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off of all best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear out there in the world right now. I am your admin, Nick Peralta of MMA Discussion. Brought to you here by editor of SportsOfAnarchy.com, Chris Bouchon. Say what's up. Hey, what's going on, guys? How are you doing? And admin of MMADiscussion.com, Jonas Peterman. Hey, what's up? All right, guys. We finally brought the, the MMA Discussion podcast back. It's been a while. Glad to have, finally have a way of putting this through to our fans. i got to say thank you to Chris for allowing us to have this, um, our opening here, to have this available to all our fans, archive, everything. It's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm excited for every podcast coming up. I'm excited, and I appreciate you. No worries, man. I just I love to have you guys involved with the site in any way, and just I, I'm happy to be on. All right, and uh, Jonas, we've actually never had you on a podcast before. Anything you want to say That's to the fans? True. That's true, and um, I'm kind of glad to break my podcast virginity today, and uh, <laughs> excited. Uh, excited. <laughs> um, as far as uh, what we got to talk about, we were going to start off the podcast with an announcement from the UFC, November seventeenth. On this day, we have, uh, but they didn't have, they didn't come out with it. They didn't have it ready, which is ridiculous. Yeah, apparently the whole event they hosted, the time is now press conference. It was supposedly a big event in store, and the schedule which they did announce, but they decided not to have the it ready. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't a decision made. It was just some plans uh, yeah. fell through, which sucks. I mean, it fell through. Yeah, now it's just a glorified Q&A with all of the event headliners in the next few months just kind of doing a Q&A there, as well as they announced the schedule for 2015. That's probably the biggest thing that you can take away from that press conference. Um, a lot of events. Oh, my God. They're going to have 30 fight nights. I think it's 45 events in total. In 45 events in total, they're going to have 30 of them as fight nights, 10 of which are going to be on Fight Pass, um, and 13 numbered events, meaning pay-per-views as well as um, a, a four to five Fox events, yeah. which is actually more wow. than I think they've had in any year as far as Fox events go. That's true. Um, so, wow, that's incredible. They're going to have two or three in Asia, uh, supposedly around five to eight, maybe more in Europe, uh, in new markets such as Poland, Russia, Holland. That's incredible. As well as uh, they're going to have, of course, uh, numerous, probably around a dozen Brazilian events, uh, with the, with one or two of them probably being on pay-per-view, as well as, let me think, uh, about two or three in Mexico, uh, making one of which will be a return to Mexico City, in which Dana did, in the press conference, mention that he wants to have that Cain Velasquez Fabricio Verdun fight in Mexico City. Um, and we'll get back to uh, talking about the main event of UFC 180 this past weekend. So we'll get started off with a majorly, <laughs> majorly packed event this past Saturday. Three events all on at the same time. It was insane. We'll start off with the uh, World Series of Fighting. Had the least amount of fights, I would say. Um, started off with uh, with a lightweight affair between Jorge Patino and... Oh, I can't remember his name right now. Does anybody remember his name? I did not watch that one. You didn't so... even watch that one? Let's oh. skip it then, because if I'm the only one that watched it, it'll be boring hearing me talk. We'll go to the uh, women's strawweight title fight. Jessica Aguilar versus her opponent... Unknown name, as far as I can, I can't even really pronounce it. But it goes like any Jessica Aguilar fight went. She punched in the face, showed up, took her down. It doesn't seem like to me, as far as talking about her, it doesn't seem like to me that this chick really has any competition in World Series of Fighting. It just seems like they sign whoever, and they pit her against whoever. You know what I mean? Um, there you go. Uh, for me, it seemed unnecessary as a, I mean to put her on any card obviously helps them yeah I mean she's a champion they're trying to expand themselves by having a women's division in there but she doesn't have competition I mean the the girl put up a good fight but, but I mean she got dominated definitely she was a tall rangy fighter fought from the outside well uh, landed more shots on her than I think any opponent has looked looked decent on the defense but couldn't handle the high high pace that this girl as a grappler delivers um, and she mixed it up well. She is definitely a a, a, a talented fighter. I will say, oh, yeah, it's just sure. hard to really brand her. 
She's the, definitely a top fi- fighter in the division. I think she could p- compete with any of the girls that are competing on Tough this year, but I don't think she'll have the chance to just yet. Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully the day comes where we can see her uh, maybe in the next two years or so if she's still at a, at a high um, athletic – if she's still at the high athletic peak that she is right now. Then I would hope to one day see her in the UFC strawweight division, one that they will be introducing uh, – one that they've already actually officially announced. They've had a few strawweight fights. Um, they've yeah, both they, been excited. They've already introduced it. I mean, they've had it on events, and they're doing the whole Ultimate Fighter season. Yeah. It will be definitely kicked off more so squarely by the uh, introduction of a champion come December 12th, I believe, at the Ultimate Fighter uh, tw- Season 20 finale, um, which is awesome. I'm excited about it. Uh, but as as I was saying, I would think it's hard to brand this woman the number one straw weight when it's hard to really see this woman getting any competition, um, especially by names that very few people know about. They don't even really um, – what's the word? Market them too much like these up-and-coming – like these, these – these women fighters that are assigned and, and set up to fight her, they don't even market them. They market her, which is good, but they don't even market the competition. And it kind of makes it hard to really take anything that she does seriously, that the that her competition, that that division in general, seriously. Um, I think it makes it hard, definitely. So one day, hopefully, we'll, we'll see her in the UFC. As far as the Melvin Gillard, Justin Gaethje, supposed lightweight title fight, if you read the article um, on sportsmanergy.com, you saw that he did not make weight. Came out came out very overweight, actually, as, in terms of... 158.5? Yeah, three pounds, yeah. Initially, pounds. yeah, 158.8. And then he was given two hours to cut weight. Generally, in the UFC, you see they get maybe one hour. He was given two hours and only lost 0.2 pounds. So he weighed in as uh, a... Officially at 158.6, making it a catch weight three round fight for with with the title not on the line. Um, wow, yeah, what a way to shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. Yeah, especially considering how close the fight was. Very. Yeah. I mean, yeah. given given the two rounds, given everything else, that fight could have been way more exciting. It was already a great yeah. fight for sure. I mean. Melvin says he might be going to welterweight now because he's getting older. He doesn't think his body can make 155 anymore. But, I mean, if that was a five-round fight, just seeing how it looked towards the end of the third round, I think H.E. still would have pulled it out. But yeah. for a three-round fight, it was very close. Yeah. And for a five-rounder, one a fight of a kind, the type of fight we've actually never seen Melvin compete in. Uh, Gaethje has that experience. He's been in five-round fights. Um, so, yeah, definitely I would, it probably would have swayed more. Uh, in his in his favor, more so already. It, I I agreed with the decision. I thought Gaethje won. Um, yeah, I so did I. I thought he won the first round. Melvin took. Melvin landed some good shots on him, and he was controlling with his jab. And then that was the only round I would give him. Yeah, started taking over for a little bit. And in the third round, he had Melvin hurt. He's, he was wobbling around the cage after those leg kicks. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Definitely. Uh, and I'm excited about this more so. And I make this uh. I, t- I talk about this debate with everybody that I can, that World Series of Fighting is behind Bellator. What I like about the World Series of Fighting, and we'll get into this more so later, is that they market their fighters. Not only that, but they've since they've started, which was about two years ago only, I think, um, they've been able to build up their own fighters, Justin Gaethje being one of them. Others like uh, Marlon Marias, they've even kind of brought more to the spotlight as he was a star in kickboxing already, Tyrone Spong. Um, David Branch is really building a name there, and, and speaking of which, the main event fight uh, for the middleweight title, Yushin Okami versus David Branch. Uh, David Branch defending his belt in probably the most exciting fight I think I've ever seen in a David Branch fight. <laughs> yeah, I honestly, I was really surprised by the way that went. I thought Okami was going to come in there and beat him. I haven't really seen Branch fight too much, but I was really surprised he finished him. Uh, yeah, J- one of JP's favorite David Branch moments is when he got slammed by Gerald Harris at UFC 116. <laughs> one of his not so highlighted moments. Um, yeah, that, that's that's one of the last uh, power bomb knockouts that I've seen in uh, recent history that didn't involve uh, Roxanne Montefiore. You know what I mean? Just gonna go in that joke there. Um, also, just want to touch back on the uh, Melvin Giard, uh problem, if you will. Uh, the guy's never had a problem with making weight before. 
And if you take the context of his uh, pre comments leading into uh, the event of saying that he feels like he's an A-list fighter fighting in a B league, um, I had to call into question his commitment to you know his his job. You know, I I just think he missed weight because he flat out does did not care, did not care about what was going on. I mean, yeah, you could say that. I mean, because he did say he's fighting in a B league, which is a shot at the World Series fighting a little bit, even if he doesn't, even if he's not trying to be malicious towards them, it's a little bit of a shot at them, and he did. He might not have been taken yeah. as seriously as he did in the UFC. That's that. I mean, that's just that's how I feel, and that what he's done gives me every reason to feel that way. You know, uh, if you saw how he handled his losses in the UFC, you know, you know he, he Melvin's very. Um, He's very vocal. <laughs> he doesn't hide his feelings about how he uh, how he views fighting. Yeah. And um, one of the things about Melvin in the UFC that I noticed is that there was always room for improvement, and he showed it. He improved in many di many different yeah. ways. I think more so one of the most one of the one of the best bouts I've ever seen Melvin Galar compete in was when he fought Mac Danzig. Um, he looked the best that I've ever seen him look when he fought Mac Danzig. His no, footwork, fantastic. his hand yeah, movement, no the the even he even mixed wrestling in there. He did everything right in that fight. Everything. Yep. And that was coming off a loss, I believe, to Donald Cerrone. I could be wrong. Um I believe so. I mean Melvin's that guy who can he can go out there in the first round and finish anyone. He's a scary guy in the first round, but I think he's a scary guy in any scary. round. I think that, that, that you can't ever doubt that that guy has power in any round. Uh, yeah, no, if, no, if ever no, his cardio has been questioned, that first round he comes out early, he comes out hard, he comes to fight. Oh, for sure. And like I said, he he he's definitely improved in my in my eyes when he was in the UFC in his in, his, in, in, in even before he was. Cut and I don't even agree with when he was cut. He lost one fight and was cut. He lost to Michael Johnson and boom, he was just cut. And he he wasn't a losing streak. It, it was it was an odd choice by the UFC. I think he was two for five in his last seven going into that fight or after. Yeah, but fight. one of those five was a, a a no contest, which isn't even his fault. A fight that he probably could have won. Yeah. yeah, it was a headbutt where he fought Ross Pearson and it was turned into a non no contest, I believe. Illegal knee, sir. The illegal knee? Is that what it was? Yeah. And see, for that, I think is just silly. That's not his fault. I mean, shit happens in the, in the cage, and that's what happened. It was a no contest, not his fault. A fight that, if it wasn't a legal knee, in a game of inches like like MMA is, could have been a knockout. You know? Um, and I think if it was, it probably wouldn't have even been cut. But, I mean, maybe there's, there's more to it that we don't even know about, that he's never told, that he hasn't said. I don't know. I, I didn't agree with him being cut. And and but but all of that does point to what you're saying, Jonas, in, in that you could be right. That he's not taking his run in the World Series of Fighting seriously. He's missed weight now, two for two. Um he was given a shot at a title. Um in this fight he didn't look the like the Melvin in the UFC that 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 he didn't look as good as he's as he's looked before. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it caused the question how he's going to look moving forward. If he'll even still be with the World Series of Fighting, maybe they'll cut him. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But um, I hope not. I just hope he learns from this. If he if he doesn't, then we may be seeing the end of of, the, of his yeah, career coming up. It sounds up. like he does walk back in the UFC a little bit, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And I think the World Series of Fighting was definitely happy that AG came out and won that fight because if Melvin would have beat him, especially in a, that three-round fight, it would have made their champion seem like not the real champion and yeah. Melvin missed weight. It would have been a bad situation for them. Yeah, they, well, they yeah. would have had to probably make that fight again. And then what the fuck do you do if it would have just keep if he misses weight again? What are you going to do if he misses weight again? Exactly. Oh my goodness, that would be the worst thing that could have possibly happened. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, yeah. But uh, I mean, it would have just elongated a process that they wouldn't have had to go through. Them exactly. Lucky that Gaethje came out and won. It worked out best for them. Yeah, certainly. I I'm, agree with that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, think you never know. You you have people. You'll take an Anthony Johnson for example. Here in the Rumble 2015, we're calling it still here at MMA. Me and Jonas. Yep. But if you take a guy like Anthony Johnson who had problems making weight at uh, 170, and you know, as long as I've watched him, I knew that he needed to fight at 205. But uh, 
he had a problem at 170. He gets cut by the UFC for having those disciplinary problems. And he goes on a career resurgence. Who says that can't happen with uh, Melvin? Who knows? Yeah, exactly. That that can happen. That's- Melvin didn't seem like a guy in the UFC who was having, if I remember correctly, I don't remember him in the UFC having this much trouble making weight. He didn't. He had no trouble making weight whatsoever. I don't think there's ever been a time where he was in a catchway fight in the UFC. He was such a bigger guy and he really couldn't make the weight. Right. Which calls into question for me, like thinking about him being at welterweight, it, like a size uh, discrepancy as far as him fighting. But who knows? I mean, maybe you just build up some muscle and really commit to that weight class. Uh, maybe, you know, build his body up more. Maybe it'll be a healthier option for him, yeah, especially. Maybe he is better at welterweight. Who knows? But he's not a big guy. I don't – what is he, 5'9", I think? I don't think he's – Yeah, five he's nine. not tall. I don't think he's – he's not the biggest guy. He's not like – well, hey, Johnny Hendricks is five nine, so. Five, but who knows? But hey, Johnny Hendricks is five nine, so it's not it's not to say that it's not yeah, like. Yeah, they have completely different body types. Exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying is that if he did do that, he would need to really commit to to making his body physically yeah, fit and sound for that weight class. That would probably take a kind of a long process, um, or maybe not. I mean, Anthony Johnson. The thing about him is when he when he when he did what he ha- when he moved up. I don't. As far as I know, Melvin doesn't cut like an insane amount of weight. Like, what was Anthony? He was cutting like sixty pounds or something insane to that degree to get to one seventy. He, he was yeah. Anthony was cutting around twenty five to fifty pounds every fight. He was walking at you know two twenty and shit. So yeah. See, so drop from there two twenty to one seventy. That's insane. That's insane. That's crazy. Yeah, so yeah, think about. Like that. Yeah, so see, I mean, Melvin yeah. could potentially move down safely, healthily. It could probably better for, it could be better for him um health-wise in the long run. Who knows? And then there's a uh, fights at 170 uh in um in the World Series of fighting that would definitely be uh, interesting to see him compete in, you know? Um but he would have to definitely change his body, change the way his diet even maybe. Um, yeah, just add on some weight, but it seems like 170 would be a better place just in terms of matchups because 155 doesn't really have any names outside of Gaethje and Newell. Yeah. Um, true. Uh, well, I mean, if you saw the first so fight of this card, fought. go ahead, Jonas. Yeah, uh, Melvin Guillard has fought at uh, 170 before. So. Yeah, early on in his career, I believe, right? Yeah. So see, I mean, it's it's not like it's a it's it's a wild thing to to. I mean, I'm sure because of the fact that maybe he didn't have to cut near as much weight as say Anthony Johnson for weight cutting that it was the right option for him to go down to lightweight, especially when he was in the UFC. It made sense. Um, for uh, for 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 here and now in the World Series of Fighting, maybe this is the time for him to do it. Who knows? Only he knows that for sure. And and we'll see. I hope the World Series of Fighting gives him one more chance. Um. I mean, he's one and one. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. I mean, but then, he, but you know, cut, missing weight twice is never never looks good. Though. Yeah, but I I think if they just told him if he goes up to seventy, especially in the World Series of Fighting, where the competition isn't as hard as in the UFC, they might as well just give him enough to fight there. Yeah, I mean, and 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 again, with a with a with a promotion that's only two years young, um, there, any move like that can be exciting, um, especially with matchups. Uh, seeing this guy uh, change his career up, there's always there's always that, that that intrigue factor, and Melvin has that. So I mean, if he just plays his cards right coming up, then and then it should be exciting seeing what he can do. Um, moving on to the main event, as we were talking, David Branch, Yushin Okami. It's definitely interesting to see that David Branch is making his own kind of career resurgence because now he's the champion. But I don't think many people gave him a chance coming up against Yushin Okami. I certainly didn't because I haven't seen much of him. I didn't think he was going to be able to stop the takedown. I thought Okami was just going to lay on top of him the whole fight. Well, uh, see, for me, I, I thought, okay, Yushin Okami, he's a wrestler as well. If you, if, if anybody who's listening to this has ever seen David Branch fight, he's a, he's a grappler. He's a very expert grappler. He's been in there with some big names, such as Anthony Johnson, such as, uh, you know, some, 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 uh, Big name middleweights back in the day, such as like in 2010, 2011, when he was uh, in the UFC, um, has never been a big name up till now. Now he's really making a name for himself. He's beating beating names such as Yushin Okami. Um, it's definitely interesting to see where it goes from here. The UFC, or I mean, uh, sorry, the World Series of Fighting, definitely needs to build up that middleweight division more. 
But uh, but beating Yushin Okami definitely means something. A guy that's been in there with Anderson Silva, Chael Sonnen, big names like that in the UFC. Um, it's definitely interesting to see where David Branch goes from here. And then, yeah, it's not like Okami's not a guy who was cut for losing. He was cut after he lost that fight to Jacare, but a lot of people were really questioning him being cut from the UFC. A lot of people still have him in their top 10 at middleweight before the Branch fight. And Branch went out there and he beat him and he finished him. That's really – that's not something just to look over. It's really impressive. No, that's a big win. Yeah. Huge win. Um, and big we'll see what they can do at middleweight coming up uh, for the WSOF. I would say that welterweight is probably their biggest division thus far next to lightweight. Um, and then bantamweight after that. You know, And the only real highlight they have at heavyweight is Tyrone Spong right now. But like I said, the promotion's only two years young, and I think they're doing everything right. If we could talk about this, that the, the World yeah. Series of Fighting doesn't, you know, go out and, and, and pull off any kind of weird, uh, you know, scams to kind of hook us. The only thing I think that could be a detriment to them is that they are bringing in a lot of these big name UFC fighters, and they have to pay those guys a lot. According to a lot of things I've read, the World Series Fighting isn't making much money, if any money at all. Well. You got to start – I mean, to, to make money, you got to put in money. I think they know that, and they're putting in all this money to get them on NBC Sports, which is a, a, a highlight kind of channel. You know, people watch that channel. Um, yeah, they even had the event on NBC. Yeah, they had uh, – which event was that? I'm trying to remember. The Newell Gaethje event. Newell Gaethje event, yeah. And so, I mean, they've had, they've had some great events uh, already thus far, and they're only 11 events in. Um, or 12 uh, – 11 15, or 12? 15. 15 events in. Wow. Yeah, that's 15. See, well, so, I mean, just just being 15 events in, that just shows you that they're, that they're building up stars. And they're building them organically, I guess you could say. I mean, they are building some stars, but I think they're also – they're putting in, in a lot of money into these former UFC fighters. I think they do need a little bit of more work in building up stars, really. The only legitimate, like, titles – title holding star they have right now, aside from Aguilar, is Marlon Moraes. Yeah. And I mean, Gaethje. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's a guy who's actually coming up and saying that he would like to go to the UFC someday. Yeah, um, I mean, that's going to happen, of course, because these guys – and a lot of the problems with the divisions, there just isn't a lot of depth there. There's uh, the good title holders in the divisions that I named, but, I mean, aside from that, who can you really think of that's going to be a challenge to the champions in the divisions? I don't know, but, see, that's just something that they got to they got to work on. they got to build. they got to uh, – they got to work on, like I said, it's only two years new. And coming up on their third year, I think they've done all right. Um, if they're not making money, it's because they're putting in a lot to, to really, you know, build their brand. And once the brand gets bigger, once it's once it's at a, at a certain level, I think the money starts coming in. Most businesses have, you know, have to do that. And I think that there's, this one's no different. And thus far, they're doing a great job. I see big things going on for World Series of Fighting. I think it'll be a, a premier event uh, in the next five years or so if they continue on the the, uh, the track record that they got. Yeah, they sign a lot of these these uh, fighters from the, the UFC. Um, but if you see it, not only half of them are really doing successful. I mean, they've picked up some bantamweights, uh, and Marlon Marais tore them down. They, uh, I would like they. You got Melvin Gillard from the UFC. He got he just got beat. You got Yushin Okami from welterweight. You just got or from uh that middleweight from the UFC. He just got beat. You got some uh, guys at uh, welterweight who are definitely making it interesting in World Series of Fighting. We still have to see how those play out. Um, it, it is definitely going to be for me. I'm excited. I'm excited for World Series of Fighting. What they got, what they have to offer. I'm kind of hooked. I think, uh, and and I like how that how they're presenting themselves. Uh, I say I see the World Series of Fighting when they when it comes to how they market themselves with the, with a the, with a little bit of class. You know what I mean? It's just look, we have this competition, we have these fights. Um, come and watch us; it's gonna be awesome. And that's all that you really need sometimes. They're definitely, they're not. They're definitely not gimmicky, but you always you, they're always just gonna wonder, especially with the level of competition a lot of these champions are facing just like how these guys can do in the UFC and you're thinking that eventually most of these guys are going to want to go to the UFC so they're going to have to do some more building in terms of depth in their division so if you have an Eddie Alvarez situation where he wants to leave you have someone else who can fill his shoes mm -hmm. and there, yeah and there's like a, and there's like almost a non-spoken agreement with the World Series of Fighting in the UFC because some fighters have gone there and other fighters have gone like there's a trade-off 
you know, certain fighters have gone from World Series of Fighting to the UFC and vice versa. Um, and I think it, that that's a healthy kind of relationship for the World Series of Fighting to have, actually. Um, as I long mean, as it doesn't uh, saturate them. You know what I mean? I mean, if you want to call World Series picking up uh, scraps that the UFC has dropped off, i.e. Uh, Rosemar Paul Harris and, you know, Jake Shields, everybody that the UFC has been cutting, that's who the UFC or WSOS has been going after. I wouldn't necessarily call it a trade, but that's you do see fighters crossing lines that way. Yeah, they seem to have a good relationship with each other, the World Series of Fighting and the UFC. But, I mean, a lot of the times they're just getting guys that they did drop off, like you said, Jonas. They're just coming after the guys who they released. They're, I think the World Series of Fighting could work as a developmental league for a lot of these up-and-comers, but... I don't think they're ever really going to be able to compete with the UFC. I'm not even sure if they'll ever be able to compete with Bellator, to be honest. Well, I mean, they're the new guy. It's it's sad to fault them for that, but that's just that's just the nature of the beast. They're the new kid on the block. You know, Bellator's had they've been around for a number of years. Uh, UFC's been the household name for MMA for ever since you know Ultimate Fighter has been going on, but. People like us, we've known about the UFC before then, and uh, that's just all that that's all the World Series is a victim of being just being new, which is unfortunate. And I, I really hope they do a better. I hope they are able to grow because they're a lot more genuine with the, what they do, which we mentioned time again on this podcast already. But they are a lot more genuine than you know guys like Bellator who have taken the WWE approach to uh, <laughs> building hype. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I went there. Sorry, but that's just how I feel. Yeah, we'll, you we'll, basically have to push through that mold of just being young, being a startup promotion. And if you could push through that and, and get some recognition, which they have for the most part, they have been able oh, to yeah. get recognition. They just need to build up more fighters underneath their champions. And see, what I think is, is it what's funny to me, and we will get into the Bellator thing like, uh, coming up here, but for me, you would think that the World Series of Fighting would be taking the approach that Bellator is taking and vice versa. Because Bellator's been around long enough where they can just rely on the competition that they have with what they with the stars that they've grown. And you would think World Series of Fighting would need to go, ah, look at us, we got this, these guys hate each other, they're throwing chairs, da 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 kind of approach, right? But they don't do that. They, 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 it's ballsy, I think, for them to come out and say, hey, look, we got these fighters, they're awesome. Watch what they do, they do this, they do that, and watch us on NBC Sports. That's all that, that's all that there is. And I, and, I, and I respect that promotion for that. You definitely can respect it, but the only negative connotation that comes from that is just that they're not generating headlines as much. I mean, what one thing they did do that was very smart of them was a few months ago, they came out with that thing saying, let's do the World Series of Fighting versus Bellator. They wanted to put up their guys against Bellator's guys in like a tournament sort of thing. Not even a tournament, just like an event, Bellator versus World Series of Fighting. Them doing that generated a lot of headlines all over media. And now they've taken a little, a little bit of a backseat, more just going, this is our fight, come watch it, which is respectable, but you have to generate headlines. Yeah, I hear you. And so we'll move yeah, away from... a huge power play on them as far as uh, MMA market share, if you will. Um, that would have been a huge power play for both uh, Bellator and World Series if they went through with that. Uh, huge move against the UFC. And that would have made the UFC think about what they're doing as far as uh, quality of uh, cards and events. So uh, I hope to see that someday. Yeah, I hope to see that. I really hope to see that someday. Somebody's got to make a move on the UFC. The competition is healthy. It's necessary. So. It's, I agree with you 100%. We'll move away from uh, the World Series of Fighting now as, um, as we move on to another card that happened this week. Bellator, <laughs> Ortiz versus Bonner. A very very awesome card. I mean, if you if you watched it, uh, starting it off, King Mo coming off with that uh, amazing highlight uh, victory against uh, Joe Vitapo, who came in on short notice, fought valiantly, but man, King King Mo with them hands. King Mo came with it. Yeah, he's just he's such a hard guy that he it seems like in the bigger fights he has more a little bit of trouble doing like what he should be doing, getting these guys to yeah. the ground and just putting a beating on them, but. Like in the Rampage fight, he wasn't really able to take him down at will, and he wasn't really attempting to as much. 
Same thing with the Emmanuel Newton fight. He seems like in these big fights that he just wants to stand there, and then against guys like Joe Vettipo, he just takes him down and beats him up. And yeah, it's so strange how he does that. You think he would, you know, use his winning strategy in just about any fight he's in, but uh, I don't know what it is about, you know, Emmanuel Newton or Rampage that gets him to go away from what he does best. Yeah, so, he. I mean, the guy, he's a good, he has good stand-up. There's no doubt about that, but his bread and butter is his wrestling and his ground pound. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, hey, even it, it's funny is that, you know, there are a lot of fighters that stray from that. Quentin Jackson, I think, is the primest example, like the most prime example yeah. that you can think of of a wrestler who decided to stray away from his hands. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that, that's unfortunate when guys – and it's not even a matter of they should just go strictly to wrestling. They should mix it up. There should there should be a, a there should be a level of okay I do this well and he thinks I'm gonna do this and you know there are certain fighters that could put it together off the top of my head this year one of the guys that that showed the the, the, the most beautiful example of that was probably TJ Dillashaw in his fight with Henan Burrell earlier this year oh yeah a guy that mixes it up goes in there makes you think he's gonna take you down and then hits you in the face and then when you think he's gonna come in with hands he puts you on your ass that's a that's that's the and and King Mo seemingly has the tools necessary to do that. Um, he, 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 he can definitely um, hang with you standing, and he can take you down, put you down. He's strong. He can put you against the cage, dirty box. He's just not, hasn't found that right rhythm yet, I think, and uh, he should find it soon. I mean, he's not. I wouldn't say he's at the twilight of his career, yeah, but no, he, he probably is in his prime, and I would say you know you got to yeah. find that now and, and start – and start and start showing it because he, he he has that he has that ability he has that potential um and i would think he knows it but he just doesn't you execute it you know it's it's all about execution in there and he, he has yet to show i think his finest performance yet um yeah, for me the tough, the tough thing for him he in bellator now is that he's competed for the title twice. He's competed against champion Emmanuel Newton twice. And there isn't really much competition, especially at light heavyweight there. I mean, there's a few guys here and there that he can fight, like Rampage again. He's fought Newton twice. He can fight Tito. But outside of that, there's not much competition. So he, everyone wants him. Like, he could get a title shot just because of lack of competition. And then you see him go in there with guys like Joe Vitapo and just beat them up. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about Bellator, sort of like it is with the World Series of Fighting, one of their Achilles heels is their their lack of, of star heavyweight power. You know, like in the heavier divisions, such as heavyweight and light heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Though I I will say I am getting excited about Bellator's heavyweight division, while it I would say it's the best competition out there. It's a lot of guys who actually go out there and put on exciting fights, they're exciting fighters. Um, such as Czech Congo, Bobby Lashley, you even have uh, um, guys like Attila Vey, um, who who's who's making the jump up there, which would be exciting to see how they do up there. Um, yeah, did, was I mistaken when I saw uh, James Colossus Thompson up there? Oh, yeah, no, he's also there. But <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Again, I didn't say that this competition was the best. I'm just saying these guys go out there and, you know, put it down. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, as I said, their lack of, of of talent in the heavier divisions is is yeah. the same problem World Series of Fighting has. But I would say Bellator is coming out with some exciting fights going on uh, there for any for any you know just purebred fight fan. Um, as as far as King Mo moving forward, we'll go into that once we uh, talk about the the main event of this card. But other than that, King Mo had an impressive showing. If you saw it, uh, I'm. I personally am excited to see where King Mo goes from here. Uh, moving on from that, we had an amazing uh, fight, uh, as short as it was, with uh, with with uh, kickboxing uh, slobber knockers Joe Schilling and uh, Melvin Manha. And poof, oh, man. man. I mean, uh, for anybody that doesn't know about Joe Schilling, he's a kick, uh, former kick, well, he's still a kickboxer, but a kickboxer, also MMA fighter, and... The man, if you haven't seen him, has had a year. You know, he's had an exciting year. Competed. Uh, Chris, you would know this. At which uh, Glory tournament did he participate in? Do you know the number of events? Um, I I think he he did compete in the Last Man Standing, but I saw him compete live against Wayne Barrett in the main event of Glory 12 in New York. 
That's all. Yeah, he participated in a middleweight tournament, an eight-man middleweight one-night tournament, and he wasn't. And, and he was just this guy. There's this guy. He's a spot filler, and he goes in there, and he, and then and, and Melvin Manhoff was in the same tournament actually. Um, but they go in this tournament, and Joe Schilling just shocks everybody, knocks out the first guy. In an exciting fight, goes into a sudden death round in the second round uh, of, of, of I cannot remember his opposition, but I remember that they're big Wayne names. Bar- I, I'm pretty sure his second fight was against Wayne Barrett again. Really? Well, I mean, he goes into this tournament and and goes in in the second round in in, in a in a sudden uh, you know sudden death round and gets the knockout, which is insane. So he, in this in this wild tournament, here he is, goes into the final, doesn't win it. But has an impressive showing, and he and and he's had a, he's had a year, man, to compete like that that many times in one night, and then uh, and then now he's competing in, un, under Bellator's banner, and what a way to present yourself there to just get in there and get the knockout against one of the most savage knockout artists artists in our sport, um, in Melvin Menhoff, and it was like, man, just that it, it, he hits him with a, an underhook right there with the right hand, and the left hook wasn't even needed. Puts Melvin Arnott, Matt Hoff, right out. I mean, yeah, he kind of gave him that two piece and left the biscuit out, man. Just doing it. <laughs> so fast in real time, too. I was just blown away. Yeah, I was just playing so like, I got knocked out, too, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it was definitely really interesting to watch these guys because they're both transitioning from kickboxing. Well, Manhoff's obviously competed in MMA, but Schilling, not as much. And he's been known as to be a slow starter, even in kickboxing. And that's exactly what happened here. He was getting beat up by Man Hoof. He almost yeah. Got he even got caught. Out yeah. Out and he looked all yeah. he looked down in the fight. He looked like he might have been out of the fight in the first round. Then he comes out in the second and just delivers a stunning knockout. And it was really it was really cool to see those guys compete inside of the cage. Honestly. Okay. Yeah, that's another kind of um, that's another almost unset agreement there is because we've actually seen certain not bigger not not as big a names as joe Schilling has made for himself not bigger names in kickboxing like you would see in joe Schilling or Mel, melvin manhoff but there have been a few glory kickboxing fighters that have gone and fought for bellator that that do have you know current mma uh careers going on right now maybe they don't have the kind of name that you know like as i said joe Schilling and melvin manhoff have yeah. but you, that, that wasn't the first um fight where you've seen uh kickboxers you know go in there yeah. and show their talent in mma um, and glory and bellator both have that spike correlation so i'm pretty sure that's where that stems from yeah exactly and so and yeah and so first and, and it's great to see joe Schilling get in there uh in his mma career and and uh and get the win in uh he doesn't have the most uh, the, the the nicest cleanest looking record as as of right now in mma he's only now he improves to two and three uh, hopefully he can improve on that career. I mean, beating Melvin Manhoff is no joke. Um, yeah, I mean, there isn't. he definitely has room for improvement in MMA, especially, I would say, in his ground game. But the guy's training with the Diaz brothers. He's definitely he's definitely a talented athlete, and he can step it up. He could be something in Bellator for sure. Exactly. And we move on to the co-main event, which, let me be honest here, I think should have been the main event. We move on uh, yeah, to the Bellator lightweight title fight between Michael Chandler and Will Brooks. And, oh, my goodness, what an upset. I felt. I was definitely yeah, surprised. No. Will Brooks getting the fourth-round stoppage victory over Michael Chandler, the former champion, in a, in a very odd ending. Um, it was definitely odd. <laughs> yeah. Like, he waved it off. He just flat out waved it off. I didn't know you could wave off your own fight, but... <laughs> But, I want to think that uh, there was an injury that we don't know about that happened that we couldn't see. Well, I think it's hurt. Chandler, he spoke about it. I saw an article that he did speak about what happened. He said it, it wasn't an eye poke. It wasn't anything like that. He got caught, and he kind of just like, I guess he didn't know where he was and or some, not something of that degree and just put his hands. I don't know what the reaction was, but it was an odd reaction to have have which i've never seen before but it happens i mean it was just really odd. yeah I, I watched the uh the bellator uh post fight press conference and and i saw him speak about it he spoke c- citing that you know he was just he was getting hit 
and didn't know where he was and didn't know even know how, how he was reacting. I don't think he doesn't know that that is what, what he was doing out there. He wasn't aware. And that just shows you that it, it that at the end of the day, if, if that's what he if that's what really was going on, it was a good stoppage. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, he obviously was out of it. He was out of the fight and it's, it, it was a good call. When I first looked at it, it was like, it was a bit odd, just, I didn't know what was going on, so I was like, what just happened? And then, once you look back at the replay and see, it was definitely a good stoppage. Exactly, especially when he speaks on, on the finish like that, and uh, and wow, and there, and, and that's definitely, uh, 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 I can see how this benefits Bellator, to see a, 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 a guy who's making his name solely in, in, in the Bellator brand, like Will Brooks, coming up. When you have Eddie Alvarez, who's just uh, who has just exited the, the promotion, and now you have a guy coming up, making a name for himself, could potentially become a, a big star. Um, yeah, it was definitely it was definitely a star making performance for Will Brooks. I mean, Chandler was pretty much the poster boy of Bellator. If you know anything about Bellator, you definitely know Michael Chandler. Exactly. And it was it was a bit weird to me. I mean, it was definitely a star making performance for Brooks because the last fight Chandler was hurt and. This fight was a, a lot different. I mean, maybe Chandler was still hurt. Maybe he did get another injury. Or maybe it's just one of those situations where Will Brooks is just a guy who's hard to match up with for him. It's kind of like the Daniel strauss Pack Curran fights where Strauss is just a hard matchup for Curran. But I, I expected a little bit more out of Chandler. I mean, he did fight hard, but it didn't look like the same Michael Chandler that was the champion who beat Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, and we can agree to that. And and now and and that was an even more impressive victory than the last one. He did just compete with Michael Chandler in his last outing uh, at Bellator yeah, 120. So that's two wins in a row over there over now what was thought to be their their top ranked lightweight. And now that's not the case. Yeah. And now uh, Will Brooks moves to 15 and one. That is an impressive record. He's, yeah, um, I mean Chandler, in my opinion, was up until now. I thought of him as one of the best guys at lightweight in the world because. I thought he won that second Eddie Alvarez fight, and I thought he beat Will Brooks in their last fight. Yeah, but, I mean, there's no question about it now. Will Brooks proved to be the better man this past weekend. Uh, we'll see what happens with Michael Chandler. It's definitely an odd uh, position for him to be in right now. Yeah, he's basically beat everyone else in the division. Yeah, exactly. And now Will Brooks being a lightweight, um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do with him. As far as Will yeah. Brooks, he's now a champ. He gets to sit back and just start knocking off contenders. Um, but what's, what's, what I like about Will Brooks is that he's vocal, but not in the way that, you know, such say Conor McGregor, he doesn't, you know, go out there, talk smack. He doesn't, you know, he, he's putting well, his name out there in a way of, of speaking of his mind as speaking his mind as far as what he doesn't like about his promotion as, and not in that he's, he's, he's bashing them, but he's telling them what he doesn't think is yeah, necessary. That was more- in the Bjorn Rebney era than the Scott Coker era, though. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, and Jonas has his own opinion about that as far as Bellator coming up. But let's talk about the main event. We'll move on to that. Congratulations, Will Brooks, the new Bellator lightweight champion, undisputed before, at this point. Um, before we move on to the main event, though, I just want to say that I, as Will, Will Brooks is his champion, I just hope Bellator provides him with some adequate competition. Yeah, and I think at, at lightweight, Bellator is their – has that's their best division, definitely. A lot of stars there. They got you know um, D- David Rickles, Rick Hahn. Um, I mean, maybe some of those names don't stand out to some guys, but they those are those are talented dudes. Definitely. I actually I would say featherweight's probably the best division, but one fifty five. Debatably, yeah. Good. I mean, definitely like one forty five, one fifty five. Their best divisions hands down. Plus they got Pachiki, Pitbull, Ferrer there. You know, um, a lot of good guys at, at lightweight. I I would say. Um, and we'll see. And and you know, it's actually funny is that there's actually some guys coming up. You know, I have Paul Sass, Terry Adam, Ryan Couture that have been signed. Bellator uh, knockoffs, I would say. You would say, um, but you know, it, it definitely makes to makes the division a little more exciting, especially with a new champion um, in there now. And we'll see what happens. I'm definitely excited. As far as for their division, there at lightweight and featherweight, I'm always down to watch. Pat Corn, one of my favorite fighters. Uh, featherweights uh, in Bellator always bring it. Definitely, the the Ferrer brothers. It's 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 easily their most exciting um, showcase that they have. Is those divisions right now? But we'll move on to the main event here with uh, Tito Ortiz and Stefan Bonner. And let's just be real, we should not have been the main event. But um, 
especially when you have especially when you had a title fight underneath it you know a five round fight underneath a three round fight i found that very odd and just kind of weird yeah i didn't feel just right so they could promote that as a main event they could promote tito ortiz have his name in the main event yeah and i mean i guess that's that's no one's fault really i mean people want to fault brooks because he's not him but I mean, just because these two have names, that it wasn't a talented fight, I would say. I will say Tito looked better than, than others, but, I mean, it's not hard to look too nice against Stefan Bonner. The guy just goes out there and just kind of tries to put it on you, but without too much technique, if at all, you know. Yeah. Um, but kudos to Tito. He got the win. Um, yeah, I didn't even think it was a split decision. The fact that it was a no, split decision. I thought, I thought Tito clearly won the fight. I think it was yeah. three to zero. <laughs> So some judge was just being silly, or he was paid off just to make it seem exciting for the end of the event. Because that would I mean, just... some of the rounds were a little bit close, but I thought Tito clearly won all. Yeah, the rounds. he closed out each yeah, round on I top think. with with uh, and, and while they were close, he closed out each round on top, putting the beating on him. He he definitely uh, beat up Stefan Bonner more. I mean, in every yeah. which way, I felt he won this fight. Tito Tito definitely had his way with Stefan Bonner Saturday. Yeah. Uh, there was really not much that Bonner was doing to even make me think that he won a round. So, yeah, I'm with you there on the whole 30-27 for uh, Tito, 100%. And let's that, talk that, about this real quick it. because it's it's a it's a debated topic where, you know, Bellator feels the need to have to, to sell us on, on certain kind of fights. This being one of them, this not being the most exciting. I don't think that this needed to be the main event. I think it could have done just as well. If you had to put Michael Chandler and Will Brooks as the main event and shown the history between these two, the history at lightweight, the fact that Eddie Alvarez isn't there anymore, the fact that there's a, there's there can be a possible new era in the lightweight division of Bellator um, with Will Brooks. And sure enough, I mean, I think if you'd have seen that fight live after hearing that kind of promotion, it would have been exciting to watch. And then, oh, my goodness, there it is. There's Will Brooks, the new champion. Yeah, the, but- the, the torch has been passed. That's incredible, right there. It's, I mean, it's yeah, it's good for people like us who watch all these fights, who know all these fighters. Of course, we want to see that fight in the main event. But Bellator did the smarter thing, I guess you could say, by putting Tito in the main event, just because you can put more more out there. You, That's you, can, you can just put his name out there more, and you have it. It's Bellator 131 or Tease versus Bonner. You just have Tito's name there. It already brings fans who have watched him in the UFC, like. If you're just a casual fan and don't know what's been going on, you're like, oh, Tito Ortiz is fighting. I better watch. Yeah. You know, Michael Chandler's fighting. Who? Who's that? Yeah. What What I find – what but what bugs me about it here is, is – as I'll be honest, is it, it feels like <laughs> – if you, like, go to Twitter following that event, following certain fans, it's like they couldn't get enough of bashing Bellator for this, for this kind of main event. I mean, it was clear that these men – you know, have had careers and and have had their moments in in their careers. This is not one of them for either of them. I don't think. Um, well, of course, but those for the most part are fans like us who watch Bellator on a consistent basis. We know who Michael Chandler is. We know who Will Brooks is, and yeah. we know Tito's past his prime. So is Bonner. A lot of people who are just going through the channels, they see on th- the screen it says Ortiz versus Bonner. And they see, oh, Tito Ortiz is fighting. We know who this is. Yeah. That's the whole point. It's and, not that yeah. it's a better fight. It's not that it's a fight that sh- should be in the main event. It's right. that it's a fight that sells. It, even right. though it's not selling to us, it's selling to fans that are just scrolling through channels looking for something to watch. And that's what Bellator is trying to do with that. Yeah, I just feel like the trade off, the bad trade off in it is that, you know, they, they lost some respect points from hardcore fans. Um, I feel like from reading as many comments as I've read, going through the panels on the internet, and and seeing and seeing, uh, uh, you know, as far as what many fans have come out to say, I feel like that was the bad trade-off. Was you know they were kind of made fun of for this WWE s style promoted matchup, you know, with the whole you know bringing a dude in with a mask and pushing and shoving and talking smack across interviews and and another MMA media. It just it was just odd. And I mean, a lot of people did, did say, including Scott Coker, that that was all Bonner's doing with the masked guy, which was that it was definitely weird. 
but it generated views. I know just from, I also write for MMANuts.com and just covering that, having it on our site, it did a lot of views. That's something that Bellator does that the World Series of Fighting doesn't do, but it generates headlines and it gets people interested in watching, even if it's for something silly. It, I mean, it works. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if it's yeah. working, then I guess they'll continue to do it, which to some will maybe be unfortunate. Um, Jonas, I know you had your own opinion covered on this. and, and uh, Yeah. Uh, basically, you know, we're talking about Scott Coker era versus Bjorn Redman era. Uh, if you look at what happened when Scott Coker was running uh, Strike Force, um, the, these are antics that have not – yeah, that have been seen before. These are not. This is nothing new with the whole Bonner doing the WWE ish uh, pro wrestling type hype between uh, Bonner and Ortiz. We've seen that before when uh, back when Jake Shields beat uh, Dan Henderson um, a few years ago. You know, the Mayhem Miller jumping into the cage and they get into it with uh, he gets into it with the Diaz brothers and uh, Shields. This was this is not a this is not an exclusive Bjorn Redney thing being you know kind of classless if you will. I'm not trying to say that Scott Coker is a classless guy. He's definitely a better executive than uh, Bjorn Redney ever would be. But uh, uh, Scott Coker is not below um, taking these kind of chances, making these kind of you know moves to generate hype, and that's what he's supposed to do. That's his job. So that's how I feel about that. It's, it's getting a little off subject here. They're not the UFC. They're not just the UFC is the name in MMA. That's a lot of people yeah. even refer to MMA as UFC, which yeah. UFC can at some times, not all times, but they could just throw people in the cage. And even though it might not be the best competition out there, they're still going to get viewership just from throwing guys in the cage. Bellator and World Series are fighting smaller shows like that. They have to earn their name by just doing anything to generate headlines. But Agreed. one point that you made, Chris, earlier was that, or well, actually, Jonas also touched on it, was that you know competition is good for the UFC. I don't think that this classifies as competition when you have a, a promotion for MMA pulling this off. I don't think that this uh, that that will make them a, a, a like a, a, an opponent, if you will, for the UFC as far as you know. Um, an MMA promotion. I, I, it just it's hard for me to be sold on that. You know what I mean? I don't think yeah. anyone at this point can be an opponent to the UFC. To be honest, there's no one's close. Strike Force was the closest thing we've had in years. Pride, but there's nothing like that now, and I don't think there ever will be anything like that for a very long time, at least. Yeah, yeah I agree. Well, we'll see. I mean, as I said, I'm excited for where World Series of Fighting goes and like say the next five years. It's gonna be a long process for them. They're still new. They're still they're still green, still in the process of getting the, the kinks out. Uh and we'll see. And that covers the the two events uh outside for uh outside of the UFC for World Series of Fighting belts where we move on now to UFC one eighty. A very exciting card. Um if anybody saw I mean we'll we'll just kind of skim through the prelims here, but man, we had an exciting exciting set of prelims we had um, Les. First of all, we'll just skip right on to the Leslie Smith uh, cat or uh, Jessica I yeah. fight. Oh, Amazing yeah, fight! That's the only thing I watched on the prelim, so I'm very happy. All right. Well, first of all, how dare you? Uh, you how missed dare some. You? Yeah. How dare how you? You missed some other good fights. How dare you? How dare me? How dare the UFC put low level talents on their cards? Oh, 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 oh! You just gotta Not shut fire. down. We're shut Not down. Fire. But <laughs> I understand that they're just, the cards in Mexico and they want to have Mexican fighters on their card, but I mean, even on like the pre- the prelims, I get it. I mean, you can go ahead and do that, but that's what they with the regular Ultimate Fighter show. They don't have those guys on pay per view prelims, or they don't have them on their pay per views. They have them on a separate card in general. I mean, I know they might not be able to get to have two events in Mexico. So that does make sense, but when you have a pay-per-view, when you have Hector Urbino, who lost in the first round of Tough last year, and then you have Chris Heatherly and two other guys I've never heard of fighting on the pay-per-view portion of your card, it it's ridiculous. I mean, I understand that there were injuries that Lozon was, Joe Lozon was supposed to be competing against Diego Sanchez, and 
I think um, Eric Perez was supposed to be on this card. Eric Perez was supposed and, to yeah. compete against Marcus Brimage, which those are a lot better fights than what they had, but you can't just have these guys on your pay-per-view card. You have to be ready for this, and that brings me to a point of oversaturation in the UFC. I actually, and I think they're continuing to do this with their new schedule with so many fight cards. They don't see that, yeah, if guys get injured with so many events, it's killing our cards. And they have so many lower, le- they're not low-level guys in general, but for the UFC, they're low-level guys competing in their promotion just so they can have so many extra cards. And in my opinion, more events to them equals more money. And they're also doing their events. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They have their Fox shows. They have their Fox Sports 1 shows. They have their Fight Pass shows. They want to have their cake and eat it too. And they have obligations to Fox. And then adding Fight Pass just gave them more fights to put on, which is a little unnecessary in my opinion. And I also think just more events for them equals more money, even if it's a little bit low level, lower level cards, just because I, I think the, ca- the casual fans might not watch a lower level card, but if you're going to territories like the, the way they're expanding, they're going to Mexico, China, those people are going to watch their cards just to see their native fighters, and then the hardcore fans are still going to watch those cards. Which, I mean, I was actually speaking on Twitter about this to Luke Thomas, who brought up something about their schedule, and he said he doesn't believe that it's more, they're making more money that way. And he did agree with the obligations that they have for someone, but he also said that he didn't think, he don't, doesn't think the UFC sees the consequences of having this many cards. And I do agree with that. Maybe they are that stubborn and don't see that guys are getting injured and it's killing their cards. But I do also think, in my opinion, it might be a little bit of speculation, but I think the more events they're having, the more money it is. I think they're making more money from more events. And oh, I, they're absolutely making more money from more events. I mean, it's all about the moolah, man. Yeah, what are they going to do? Charge less money to kind of break even to what they were doing back when they were having, you know, maybe 20 to, you know, 12 to 20 events a year? No way. They're, they're going to charge the same amount for every car they put out there. Of course. They don't want the fans to know that, oh, this is a lower level fight. Yeah. So they have to, cool. in some ways, charge the same amount. But One I of the- think it is a big problem with that they're putting – I think they should – honestly, even though I don't like to say they should fire people – they should cut a lot of fighters that are lower level fighters and put on less cards. Here's, here's the problem that that, that the brings. Whole thing with expanding where they want to fight in different countries and bring UFC everywhere, yeah. but it's killing a lot of these cards. When you're having take the fight night cards from what was it two weeks ago, you have Michael Bisping headlining against Luke Rockhold. Then you have a solid co-main event in Ally Quinta versus Ross Pearson on that one. Then you have the Shogun OSP card. If you put those two cards together, it's a much better event. But then you don't have two cards where they're making separate money on each card. Mm-hmm. Exactly that, and they're also they also miss out on uh, globalization. You know what I mean? Those two those, those two cards last or the week before, uh, are on opposite sides of the world. So that's that's the other thing. They're not just trying to get the U.S. money. They're trying to get world money here. So exactly that's. It. I get what they're doing because I do think they're making more money from doing that. But it just it kind of sucks for fans that are that want to watch these cards. But I mean, I didn't I don't watch these fight pass cards that they're having for anything but like the main and maybe the co-main event. Aside from that, it's guys I really don't. All right, so I guess yeah, let's just get into the card. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me say let me say this real for, for one real thing. The realest thing that that Melvin Gillard stated was that, you know, it doesn't feel like there's high class competition anymore in the UFC. It doesn't feel like it's just these, this essentially um, great high level group of guys anymore. And what that does for me as well, in, in, in terms of like looking at contenders, looking at, um, looking at guys trying to make it to the title, what that does is because there's so many guys that, you know, if a guy gets like on a good streak, gets a good streak going, it's hard because it, it, it you call into question the the level of competition that these guys have. You know what I mean? I agree yeah. in some words, but I don't think Melvin was saying that 
there isn't a high level of competition. I think he's saying it's not only the highest level of competition no. anymore. Because yeah. It, there is still the, the best fighters in the world are still in the UFC. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying that there's not that. Them, they, it's not like it used to be, I guess you could say, it was like a VIP section for the best fighters in the world. Now it's that, and then you have guys who aren't the best fighters in the world in the VIP section. Right, yeah. So, yeah, parity is basically gone in the UFC due to the volume of fighters that they have on the roster. There's just no – the parity's not there anymore. Um, you got organizations – you know, the other organizations, Bellator and uh, World Series, they're all on a virtually even playing field. You're not seeing that with the UFC anymore due to the number of fighters they have on their roster. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, guys on the low end that are going on tears, right? But, you know, much like Chris was saying, those guys that are going on tears are beating people that just aren't really great. So it kind of invalidates their streaks. Yeah, and what I don't like when this first started, like, to rewind the clock back two years, two and a half years, before they right. started getting on this insane schedule, they had, like, two, three hundred fighters signed. Now they have five hundred. Yeah, think yeah. about that. That's two hundred extra fighters. You can make a whole other promotion with that many fighters. Exactly. You know what I mean? Guys have, they have to fight so many times a year, so oh you God, have to add no. them on these cards, and it just gets to where there's a ridiculous amount of fights. What I don't like about that the most is that, you know, is like when that first started, they had they felt the need to cut certain fighters that I felt should have, with being as veteranized as they were, so guys like John Fitch, Yushin Okami, they lost once. Like they didn't have streaks of losses going on. And they didn't have bad records in the UFC. You know what I mean? John Fitch was like, what, what, uh, 13 and 3 when he got cut? Yeah, Yushin no, Okami was like, 11 and 4 it was not like these guys were bad fighters sure they and they lost to top ranked guys it wasn't like they were yeah. losing the like the, the the bucket of the barrel here they were losing the top ranked guys and that's what happens when you put top flight competition against top flight competition they're going to lose and guys like those guys were getting cut strictly to make room for these guys that you know will easily get paid like a fifth of what they were I making um, simply to put I, on I for all these events. That, I disagree a little bit. Just I don't think it was to make room for those guys. I think what the UFC that's off, sees that's off of what Dana White said. And when they see Yushin Okami, they're like, all right, these guys don't have the most exciting style, and they make a shitload of money. I'm sure that that also, also yeah. Get, if they want to get rid of their salaries, and yep. they're not exciting guys to watch, so they don't feel like they can market them. And they lost, so now they have a reason where they can say, "Oh, this guy just lost. We can cut him and he can come back if he wins some fights." Yeah, I'm sure that has that had that that. I'm sure that can actually be added on to what I was saying, though, because I'm because this what I said goes off of what Dana White was saying. He's saying that these guys can't cut it anymore. That they're that they're that their careers are winding down, and off of one loss, I think that's the stupidest thing to say. You can't base somebody's career off one loss, off I mean off a string of losses that makes sense. John Fitch wasn't on a string of losses. Uh Yushin Okami wasn't off a string of losses. And and, and if you, and even if they were, they were losses to like top top ranked guys. Like look at who John Fitch lost to in that one fight that he lost. Damien Maya. Uh Damien Maya's top 10 ranked. And then the last fight prior or I mean the last loss before Getting that loss was to Johnny Hendricks, who is the champion now. And then look at Yushin Okami. He lost one fight to um, Jacare Souza, a guy who's right now in talks for being the next guy up for the, the middleweight championship uh, title shot. You know what I mean? I feel like you know that what you said has something to do with it. What I said also has something to do with it. It came from Dane White's mouth himself to state that these guys are on the downside of their careers. I don't even think that's fair. Off of one loss to say, and and I only use those two because those are the two biggest examples, especially you know what I mean. And probably because of their styles, maybe yeah, that has something to do with it. Yeah, um, we'll move on from that uh, to the rest of this card on UFC 180. But um, and and what it goes down to, yeah, is that you know those two those those first two cards on the main card probably shouldn't have been there. Injuries happen. This this is the kind of thing that you're gonna get on a card when that many injuries happens. You know, and um, 
So I mean, c congratulations to those two men who won on the on the main card. We'll just kind of go to the to the to the real highlights that this card I had think to we offer. Definitely, before getting into that, we should speak about the Jessica I Leslie Smith fight. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, uh, first of all, for fans that don't really know what's up, uh, if you saw that fight, there's. A, there's levels of cauliflower ear for people that don't know about it. I have it slightly in my left ear. I don't have it anywhere else because I've done high school wrestling. I've been doing jiu-jitsu seven years, so I understand what it's – there's there's certain ears. Like if you look at Randy Couture, that guy has cauliflower ear up the ass. It's pretty bad. But he gets it drained. And what, that, what I mean by that, you get the excess fluid out of there, the blood, and, 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 there's, and then when you do that, you get what's called soft cauliflower ear where it's just – you know, it's it's hollowed out, as you could say. There's no fluid in there. It's just the ear, and it's just and it's empty essentially because it's so just brutalized in 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 just training, wrestling, grappling mostly. Um, and and Leslie Smith going into this fight did not have it drained, so it was full of blood. It was full of fluids. It was full of you know, um, just whatever it is that runs through your ear. I don't know exactly all of that stuff yeah, but that's what that's essentially what the problem leslie smith had going into that fight she didn't drain it so once jessica i punched it that thing just popped and man that was gross <laughs> and it split her ear wide open split her ear yeah. wide open there was a gaping hole there uh for anybody that saw the and pictures the blood that just squirted out. Oh. Oh, yeah it was probably the nastiest thing you've seen in a women's fight in quite a while I think it was one yeah. of the bloodiest women's fights the UFC has had thus far. Um, next to maybe Katz and Gano, uh, Misha Tate, that was another bloody fight. Um, but that, but yeah, I mean, I was excited for that fight. That fight delivered the way I knew it would too, because both women bring it. They're great strikers. Leslie Smith is a, a is a, is one of the toughest chicks uh, around. She moves forward at all times. Doesn't care. She didn't even want the fight to stop. That brought his nuts. She was. Yeah, she could have <laughs> lost her ear easily. She, yeah, she didn't care. I mean, yeah. she after looking at it at the end of the fight, she went on social media and agreed that that yeah. it's probably a good That's thing that fight was stopped. That was one of those moments where you're glad a fight was stopped for the health, yeah. for the for the well being of a fighter, and and definitely that that I mean, and you, if you saw the pictures of her ear after the after the fight, a couple hours after, you could see inside of her ear because it was hollowed yeah. out. As I was explaining earlier, there was no fluid in there. Yeah. <laughs> It was quite disgusting. Just, Pretty gross, just, you know. And I mean, this fight before the whole ear incident, this fight was probably the most relevant fight on the prelims. It was the number six ranked girl in Jessica I versus number thirteen, I believe, in Leslie Smith. I mean, it's two top ranked girls in the women's bantamweight division, and I mean, Jessica I is just outstanding. Standing to watch her boxing skill is so crisp and she's so fast. It she's really fun to watch. Yeah, to be honest, uh, side note, I would have liked it if this fight was on the main card. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah, it, it should have been, I think. I mean, it maybe was, it was it was something they want to show, because now the UFC is doing this thing where they want to, like, highlight the prelims now. Yeah, they, with, and it, the weird thing, it wasn't the main event of the prelims. I guess it was... Well, because they had the Ultimate, ultimate Fighter fight finale on there. there. Yeah, it's because they had the Ultimate Fighter finale. And I'll say this right now. I thought that the two spots... In the main card should have been, if not by the Leslie Smith Jessica I, what they should have done. This is what they should have done. They should have put the Jessica I Leslie Smith fight as the headliner of the prelims, and they should have put the Ultimate Fighter finale uh, fights at featherweight and bantamweight on the main card. They did that for t for Tough Brazil when it first came out. They put that on the pay per view. I don't see why they couldn't have done the same here. Instead, they put names that people actually haven't even don't don't even know. These guys, yeah, we're making their debuts, but they're not coming off the Ultimate Fighter. If you watch, if you were like me and watched the Ultimate Fighter Latin America, which was an amazing season, all the fights were great, plenty of finishes, plenty of you know uh, of of backstory that were that that's actually more relevant for these fighters than you see on the Ultimate Fighter, say in America. Um, or even now on the Ultimate Fighter season twenty going on, um, it, it 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 would have been amazing to have those finalists on the pay per view because they they put on great fights. You know about these guys, you've heard their backstory, you've seen what they're the, what they're about, and I think that they should have been on the main card. And they put on great fights too. Um, if we go, that's not a bad point to make, but I think. First of all, being on Fox Sports, it gets them more exposure because more people do view it. Sure. And either way, I think it's still 
low level competition for a UFC pay per view. I mean, yeah, those guys might have had great fights on the show, but if you, say you put them in there with a UFC like a top ranked UFC guy who's coming off the Ultimate Fighter, they're not. It's not going to look too good. They're not. Mexico is still far behind in MMA in comparison to the USA, Canada, and Brazil, which are the main components of MMA. They're not guys who are going to be able to compete at the highest levels in the UFC coming off the show. Uh, I agree on viewership. Um, the competition that that um, you never know really. I mean, did you watch? Did, first of all, did you watch this season? No, I did not. Yeah, well, I mean, I I watched it, and uh, uh, to a degree, I can see where any argument could clearly be made. I can't even argue against it because they haven't faced that kind of competition. Not all of them. Some of these guys have been competing for a while. They have veteranized records, like uh, some were, you know, in in their in their in their 20s of fights like you know they fought over 20 times some of them near it um as far as their level of competition i think that they're that they're nearly there but if you also look these guys are very young uh this the the finalist in in the featherweight fight leo morales uh is 21 and it's it's just and most of them were in their early 20s and, and and it just showed you how 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 young these guys are these guys are like young and they have these veteranized records but and i think that just shows you potential and that's mainly what the ultimate fighter has always stood for is potential and i mean we'll even get, we, we'll, and i'll speak on that more later when we talk about kelvin gasolin um but also um one more point to make is that these guys um train with some of the top guys in the world like most of these fighters if you saw train at american kickboxing academy at different branches of them some of them at alliance mma others uh at the uh, uh even one of them now trains at, at duke rufus's gym in uh in in wisconsin um it, it just shows that you know these guys still train at, at high at least train at high level um I mean, I can get into uh, to more so the, the, the finalists, uh, Alejandro Perez versus Jose Quinones for Bantamweight. Uh, it was an excellent affair. I thought the fight uh, was, was scored correctly in 29-28, uh, uh, but I guess because of the point deduction, uh, there was uh, a difference of pointage, I believe. I guess uh, I think uh, the, the it ended up being like 29-26, and... That's mainly due to um, Jose Quinones. If anybody, uh, Quinones, if anybody remembers, he seemingly was winning that fight until that headbutt. Does anybody remember that that fight? Yeah. The headbutt yeah, fight. Yeah. Jose Quinones, the guy on top, the taller fighter, the guy who was hopping around, looking all Clay Guida. You guys remember that one? Yeah, that guy was yeah he he was moving around hopping, which was insane to when you think about the cardio he must have he must have to possess in order to move around like that at that altitude just oh it was crazy. Um, because for anybody that doesn't know, this event was spotted in an in Mexico City at a spot where they're at the eighth highest elevate elevated area at least sports arena in the world, which is crazy. Yeah. To think about, you know, yeah, and yeah. this guy was hopping around like like you know, like a jackrabbit, just kind of trying to, you know, uh, he. I wouldn't say Jose was winning the striking exchanges. The shorter man, Alejandro Perez, uh, definitely getting the better of him. The striking, he was able to take him down a few times and possibly won two rounds. But the headbutt, uh, two point deduction from uh, from him by Big John McCarthy, which I didn't think was necessary of two points, but if it's intentional, which you can debate, it was. Uh, two points sounds fair at the same time, and couldn't find the finish. And so Alejandro Perez, your bantamweight, tough Latin America um, bantamweight winner. And then we move on to the featherweight, where you have Yair Rodriguez versus uh, Nicaragua's Leonardo Morales. Um, I thought was an exciting, exciting fight between two very high potential fighters, especially in Yair Rodriguez. The guy was. You know, throwing anything and anything that he could throw. You know what I mean? Uh, threw elbows, spinning back fists, side kicks, axe kicks, head kicks. He threw whatever at this guy. And uh, even mixed in great wrestling, mixed in great uh, uh, grappling. Uh, I'm. I, I think if anybody looked uh, like they had the highest potential coming off this season, Yair Rodriguez is that guy. I mean, I. I mean, I do agree, but in fact, in terms of 
just level of MMA in comparison, I don't think that they're going to be able to compete at the same level. I do agree with you saying that tough is for up and comers and people like that, but they're far behind. They haven't fought anyone UFC caliber. It's going to take a few years for Mexico to progress. I think the ultimate fighter brought MMA to a spotlight over there and more people, you're going to see a lot of people start getting into training and it's just going to take a few years. It's the same thing for every territory. Like, even the Ultimate Fighter China, these guys aren't going to be able to come into the UFC and compete for a title or get up into the top rankings anytime soon. You're not really helping yourself with your, your, your Latin American uh, fan base, Chris. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have much of one, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, me, I, I'm biased. I'll, I'll admit it. I'm biased. I was, I, I am born from Ecuador, so of course, going throughout the entire event, I was rooting for Marlon Vera. I'm also half Nicaraguan, so I was going for Leo Morales. Um, was excited to see both of those guys showcase their talent. I think, I, I disagree. I think that these guys are starting to really, you know, take their careers to that next level seriously. They're training with top flight competition. I think these guys will surprise you. And when they do, I'm going to be that guy that says I told you so. I'm just saying. I'm just putting that out there. I don't know. I don't I don't think so, but I we'll see. that. We'll, we'll see. see. This will be another topic for the future maybe a year from now. We'll see. Um, and we'll move on to the main card here. Uh Let's just be real. Uh, Augusto Montano and Hector uh, Urbana, Urbina, I don't know how you say his last name. Uh, they got they got first round victories, impressive victories. And Hector Urbana with the first round guillotine choke uh, against Edgar Garcia and Augusto Montano with the uh, with the starching of Chris Heatherly in, in both of their uh, bouts. They got the first round victory. Good for them. We don't know too much about these guys. Other than, you know, both born in Mexico, showed off some good talent. Augusto Montano, very Dan Hardy-ish lookalike uh, fighter. Uh, I'm, <laughs> let's see what, what – uh, as far as talking about their fights, we could just skim through that. We know that they that they showed uh, some great talent, some good potential. We'll see what the future has for these guys who made their debuts uh, on the main card for uh, UFC 180. Um, we would hope now since they did debut on a pay-per-view – that they'll they'll have something to show us in the in the future coming forward. Uh, with that being said, yeah, me, go ahead. I just want to touch on the uh, Montano and uh, Heatherly fight. Uh, just from what I saw, Heatherly just kind of let himself get uh, beat out of that one. Yeah, it was an odd kind of fight, really but finish. yeah, it, uh, just let him let him catch those knees, standing there bent over. I mean, he had ten seconds left in the round. Mm -hmm. Ten seconds left. All he had to do was move out of the way. He could have like jumped off anything. It wasn't like uh, Montano had him really pressed too hard up against the cage. Mm -hmm. From what I saw, so I just found that very odd that Heatherly just kind of curled up there in the standing position and let himself get kneed out of him. And it wasn't look. It didn't look like he took a whole lot of damage, but he certainly wasn't defending him either. Uh, but he had so much space to move. From what I saw. For, well, I mean, just, um, you know, on the outside looking in, it was a very odd finish for me. Yeah, um, I think it touched, to be honest, to me, we touched earlier on the Michael Chandler thing where it was an odd finish because of, of how Chandler was reacting at the finish there. I think it, it think it's, I think the same thing applies here. I think Chris Heatherly, if you look, the very first knee that Mont, uh, Montano lands was a knee to the stomach. And yeah. it may have stunned him to the point where he just couldn't move out of there. I think that he was just stunned. The same thing happened to Sarah Mc, McMahon when she fought Ronda Rousey, although there wasn't as much time given by the ref to really see that as a as a as a definite finish, you know, um, this one was a definite finish. Chris Heatherly wasn't getting out of there. I think he was too stunned. I think he was too hurt to move to react, and um, so I think it was just the right the right hit landed at the at the right moment. I think Augusto just landed a good knee. Chris Heatherly was stunned, couldn't do anything, couldn't react, and was put away. I think more so that that that's what I saw. Um, for me, yeah. if you look at the the slow motion replay, to me that's what I saw. Definitely an odd uh, reaction at, as well. I had the very same reaction starting off when I first saw it. I'm like, why doesn't he get out of there? It's kind of silly. But when you see the knees he landed, he was landing some clean ones to the body. And when you get hit down there in a certain spot with the right around of, right right amount of force, man, yeah, uh, you just can't move. Sometimes you just get stunned. You can't you, you can't react. I think that's what happened in this fight. And so with that, let's move on to the to the to the real highlights that this card had for us. In which featherweights, uh, top ranked featherweights, Ricardo Lamas 
versus Dennis Bermudez. Man, okay, I, I, I was. Lamas. I had Lamas all the way, and that's why he, he's just a more complete fighter. Uh, he definitely beat the shit out of. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was, it, it was not what I expected. Okay, yeah, me, I, I don't know about Chris. I had uh, Dennis Bermudez going in there and, and, and shutting it down. I thought Dennis was at is right now. He's still a young stud. He's only twenty seven, I believe. Still has time to improve. He can walk away with that with this loss and improve, and and, and really, um, and, and really learn from it, and then maybe get another streak going. And depending on who he fights next, you never know. He could he could be he could get right back into that that mix. Um, but Ricardo Lamas, yeah, man, coming in there, uh, he 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 worked them hands uh, early on and was able to put that right straight left right there. Bam, puts Dennis on his butt, and I don't even think Dennis. Bermudez really reacted correctly because immediately he got just cinched in into the choke and he had nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, the drop that he got on that uh, on that one punch, the drop that he had, uh, Lamas just jumped on him like a hobo on a ham sandwich, man. He gave it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Chris, go ahead and 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 where were you surprised? To my friend was that uh, you know when Bermudez lands on his butt on the ground, I mean that's just that's death right there. It, he has, he has to worry about getting up, not only getting up, but which direction he goes and not being tracked when he gets up. So I knew Lamas had him right then and there. So Yeah, I mean, I had Bermudez going into the fight. I am a little biased in that because I had I did interview Dennis a while back, and I've all, he has also come to my gym, done seminars. He's a really cool guy, and I spoke to him before the fight, wished him luck and everything. But here's what my thinking was going into that one. I thought the wrestling would be a wash, which it seemed like it was. Hmm. No one was really getting any takedowns on one another. I thought it would come down to the striking, and I thought Dennis would be the better striker in this fight and be able to will his way to a win. And I knew, I know Lamas' submission game is underrated. He's a solid black belt, and he can finish submissions. And like I, I thought, the only way Lamas was winning this fight is if he was able to get a submission on Dennis because Dennis, his only three losses have come by submission. But what happened, it was it was a pretty competitive fight up until the point where Dennis got dropped. And then he, he kind of just went for that desperation takedown where you get dropped and you just go for it. And Lamas isn't the guy you want to go for that for because he'll sink up a guillotine real quick like he did. I thought the way Dennis landed, he should have done more of a butt scoot and just try to back his way out and stand up. Yeah. But Stuff happens. He just went in. And he went in a little sloppily on the takedown. He might have been more hurt than everyone thought, and he got choked. Yeah. Um. Going. I mean, honestly, for me, going into the fight, I thought. Um. I thought the big difference would be Bermudez's wrestling. I didn't. I know. I know Lamas has wrestled. He's a good wrestler. I thought Dennis had the strength advantage. Uh. I think the the fact that he was the shorter fighter gave him a size. Or I think that was a positive size advantage for him. Um, and I thought that that would be the difference because I'll be real. I thought Lemus is the better striker than than Dennis. Um, uh, I thought it would come down to the grappling, and sure enough, it did. But Lamas showed that his hands, you know, can't you can't sleep on that guy with the hands. And so, see. with this fight, it's definitely interesting to see where these two guys go from here. Um, for me, I don't think Dennis should take too much of a step down. But then again, it's not like the UFC was looking at this guy like, you know, giving him the props that he really should have. It was more so the fans that were giving him the props. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, going into the fight, I thought – because the way Lamas' striking has never been like his biggest thing. He's always been more of a take you down and then he does more of his effective striking from his top position ground and pound. I thought Dennis would have the advantage in striking just based off the way he looked against Guida. He outstruck Clay Guida and – Weed is a pretty decent striker with his movement and everything, so I thought that's where he'd win the fight. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so it was definitely a surprising uh, outcome for me. Uh, you're right. Up until the finish, it, there it was. It was real. It was real close. There was no. There was no high point for anybody until Lamas landed that punch. Yeah, I mm. mean, and now going after this fight we I we did see Chad Mendez on Twitter calling for Ricardo Lamas and I think that fight makes sense you got the number four guy versus the number one guy and both of those guys recently lost to Jose Aldo and you basically just whichever one of them loses gets pushed to the back of the line again out of the title picture 
Yeah, and I mean that makes sense in in the, in the and that's the fight that I would call for too, uh, especially when you got two guys who have already fought for the title, put them against each other, um, so that way you know you only have to really worry about one trying to call for a rematch. Yeah. You know what I mean? You still, you can still get Dennis someone in the top ten. You can give him maybe the loser of Frank Edgar Cub Swanson. You can give him a Nick Lent, or you can even give him a Dustin Poirier who just came off a loss to Conor. Yeah, Lee. and uh, for any fans that are willing to go, sportsanarchy.com and read my article, Fights to Make After UFC 180, that's a fight that I'm calling for. Dennis Bermudez versus Dustin Poirier. Both guys coming off of momentum-halting losses. Um, and I think uh, a fight between those two really puts uh, one or the other back in the mix. Um that's the fight I would be excited for. Dustin Poirier with his with his uh, good hands. Guy always guy generally finishes. Dennis Bermuda is another guy who who who's who's been looking great on finishes lately. Um, both top ranked. Both could put get put back right into the mix once uh, with the winner of that one. So like and featherweight is just a crowd right now. It's just uh you know while Jose has beaten half of that crowd, they they're still. It just shows you kind of how good Jose Aldo is at the same time when you think about it in hindsight because of how crowded, how talented all these guys in the top ten are. Man, it's just a wild it's a wild goose chase going on at featherweight, um, and we'll see what happens with those two. But those are the fights I'm calling for, Dennis Bermudez, Poirier, and Ricardo Lamas, Chad Mendez. What about, what about you, Jonas? Yeah, give me one second. All right, no worries. Uh, well, with that, we'll move on to the uh, welterweight fight. The co-main event of the evening, Kelvin Gashlam, Season 17 Ultimate Fighter winner versus uh, Jake the Juggernaut Ellenberger. Now, Chris, going into this fight, you were really expecting um, Jake Ellenberger to uh, to really you know, make a comeback here, showcase the, yeah. the skills that, that is shown to, for him to be a high-level fighter. And, and I'm never d- disputing that, but it just seems to me – that Jake Ellenberger hasn't quite really made that leap in improvement that certain fighters need to make in order to really take on the, the the cream of the crop of their division. And Jake Ellenberger has always had great hands. He's a strong wrestler. Uh, he's uh, he he lacks to me on the technical side. I think that's one of the things he needs to work on the most. Um, and Kelvin Gastelum now five and zero in the UFC, ten and zero in total, undefeated. Um, I think uh, he's really one of the best success stories coming off of the Ultimate Fighter right oh, now. For sure. For sure. I mean, he he's probably has more success than many of the last few seasons combined right now. <laughs> as far as TJ Dillashaw and John Dodson, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's doing – I mean, there are certain Ultimate Fighter winners that have come off just recently that aren't even in the UFC anymore, which is kind of sad and short for their careers. It's, it's unfortunate. But this guy, man, he's definitely looking like a, a world beater right now. Um, and, uh, I, I, th- I definitely think that he's now deserving of some top 10 competition. Um, Jake Ellenberger going into this fight was ranked number seven in the UFC rankings. Yeah. And let's be real as well. I, I, it, I've never put Jake Ellenberger down saying he's not uh, one of the best fighters in that division. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem like he, he's improving where he needs to. He's not improving in the clinch. He's not mixing it up the way he should. Um, uh, but what was your assessment of his performance? Um, well, going into that fight, the way I was looking at it is, all right, Jake Ellenberger, he did lose two in a row, but they were the guys, they were Roy McDonald and Robbie Lawler, number one and two in the world at welterweight. So, And they're both longer guys, and Jake was just having trouble getting inside. I could see why he would lose those fights. And even the Rory fight wasn't like he got beat up or anything. It was a decently close fight, and it was pretty boring, but... The way I was looking at it is Kelvin's more of his size, and he I th- thought he would be able to I, – I love Kelvin. I love the way he fights. He's a very good fighter. But I thought Jake was just more experienced, thought he'd be able to beat him up on the feet a little bit, and I didn't think Kelvin would be able to take Jake down. And the thing about Jake, and the, what he needed to do was to mix things up, and he did look good in the fight. He did hurt Kelvin a few times. He had him stunned, and then – he did get that takedown go, going out of the clinch towards the end of the round. It's just that, that that scramble by Kelvin was fantastic. He got Jake's back, and then Jake kind of he was a little he looked just a little lazy, maybe even surprised that Kelvin got his back so quickly. And that's just been Kelvin's bread and butter, getting the back and getting that rear naked choke. And he oh, did yeah. it again, and that was his that was a shiny moment for him. I mean, when you think this guy's gonna lose the fight, he comes in there and wins. 
and Jake got to go. I guess this kind of puts Jake in a little bit of obscurity in the division. Now he just has to go back to the bottom of the pole and just try to work his way back up. Yeah, Kel- Kelvin, that switchy. I mean, so Jake has his back. Kelvin hits a switch, gets his back, and it seemed like Jake reacted wrong. It seemed like he was expecting punches, and instead here come the ch- yeah. here came the choke, and that and that was that was a that was a, a fatal mistake right there. And yeah. Kelvin, Kelvin man, was able to step in with those leg hooks really easily. It was just it was textbook exactly how you execute that move. Yeah, I mean um, Kelvin couldn't have executed that any better. It was outstanding. No, he couldn't have. Yeah. And the thing about it, it wasn't even the choke that was the biggest thing for me. The it was just the scramble that he got Jake's back so yeah. quickly. That was yeah. the most important part of that, and it was the most impressive part of what Kelvin did there. Because up until that point, for the most part, aside from that one takedown he got early on, he wasn't winning that fight. No. And uh, agreed. Yeah. And so now, yeah, Jake now goes 0-3 in his last three, and, and, and that it puts him in a tough position. But when you look at that competition, he's lost to Rory McDonald. Guy's about to fight for the title. Next. Yeah, after with the after- UFC, you never know. I mean, he might have – he has to win his next fight or else he, he's definitely in the probability of getting cut, especially as we discussed earlier, they're cutting a lot of guys. He has to win his next fight. If yeah. He gets- yeah. He's on the bubble after this, after Saturday for sure. Yeah. I mean, I bubble. mean, losing to Rory and Robbie doesn't do too bad, but now it's, I mean, those are the top stars now, but now he's losing to, uh, the, the, the big up and comers, the star up and comers. Yeah, like Kelvin. Kelvin, Kelvin was still ranked number 11. It's nothing against him. It's just that, Either the way you slice it, you lost three in a row. Yeah, and so definitely, if he's if he stays, um, he definitely needs to win his next one. Uh, an exciting mashup, as odd as it may come off off the top of my head, I would love to see Jake Ellenberger and Yoshihiro Akiyama next. I just feel like that's an exciting kind of showcase for 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 Yoshihiro. He seems like a mid tier level guy right now. He made an exciting comeback earlier this year on the Japan card against Amir Sadala. Um, and so we'll and and I think a fight against Ellenberger, if say he won that, would be an exciting you know uh, a run that he's already starting to come back on. Uh, for Jake, it would definitely be a big name to come back against, and um, and so it, I think that that fight makes sense for KG. I would love to see him against Dung Young Kim. I think uh, that's another uh, top ranked guy that he could fight right now to see where he's at on the grappling. You know what in I mean? my opinion, I think you could put Gastelum in there with someone higher ranked because. He, I think he steps ahead of um, Dong Young Kim. He did step ahead of him on the UFC rankings. Now That's he true. Basically, swap spots for Jake. He did swap spots with Jake. Now Jake's 11th, Kelvin 7th. I think you can give him maybe Tyron Woodley. Maybe. Oh, well, Tyron Woodley's ranked number three. But, um, I, I mean, the only reason I would give him Dong Young Kim, he's ranked 10. He's a, he's a, he's a different type of challenge than Jake. Um, and But, yeah, I mean, now he is ranked below him, essentially. So... Uh, I'm just, but also you look at the rest of the division; they're all tied up, especially with Carlos Condon being injured. Matt yeah. Brown just accepted a fight with Tarek Safadine, who's ranked, I think, number eight right now, uh, or nine. Um, Safadine's nine. Yeah. Safadine's nine. Uh, yeah, and then you have Woodley at three. I mean, maybe that fight does make sense. Woodley, as far as I understand, does he have an opponent? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hector Why not? <laughs> Hector Lumba wanted to fight him, and he said no to that fight. So yeah. why not? Or Hector Lombard, even. Early too. Or even Hector Lombard. Or Hector Lombard is fighting Josh Berkman next, correct? Yeah. Which is an odd fight, but... Hector is fighting Josh Berkman. No, no one else would take the fight, he said. That's... Well... I mean, and <laughs> as of... With Jake, it depends what they want to do with him. If they want to put him in somewhere in there with someone who's not ranked, you could do the Akiyama fight, but I think you could also do with him, you could put him in there with a, a Gunnar Nelson who... Just lost his last fight. You could put him in there with the Mike Pyle who just lost his last fight. You could put him in with someone like that who's still like in the top fifteen, top like sixteen guys in the division, and just see if he could still hang with those guys. You're talking about Ellenberger, correct? Yes. All right, sorry, I didn't hear the name. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like I said, those fights make sense. Um, uh, as far as um, K- KG goes, the sky's the limit with that guy, and now he has a whole top ten crop of dudes that he could fight. As far as Jake Ellenberger. Yeah, fighting the top 15 would make sense. Mike Pyle, no, only because he's already beat him and knocked him out. Um, oh, yeah, I did. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, and um, – but, yeah, I mean, Jake is still a, co- a competitor. He's still a he's – a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a top-ranked talent. 
he, I just think he needs to start improving. He starts needs to start getting better at, at what uh, at, at um at everything that's going on with him. I think his wrestling needs to be more of a of a highlight with him. So as far as what what I'm trying to say, it's like coming down all weird, but he just needs to improve. Bottom line, I think, I think he may have been straying away from his wrestling not in the fights themselves even though he has i mean more so in training i think he's a little bit like comfortable he knows he can wrestle and he strays away from in training now because he says he's been spending most of his time with uh edmund who's his striking coach he striking coach of ronda rousey he says he spends most of his time training up there and i i don't i think he's been neglecting his wrestling training i may be wrong because i mean i don't know that's a guy trained but it seems like that might be a possibility yeah, who knows? I mean, you might be right. We'll move on to the main event. And, oh, okay. As a as a Mark Hunt fan, you got to just think, oh, I mean, let's be real. Mark Hunt was winning that fight. Uh, oh, for sure. For sure. I think he won the first round. I think he was – I think he, he wasn't in danger anywhere up until that finish. If you'd have told me in a heavyweight championship fight – that Fabrizio Overdoom was going to land a flying knee and knock out Mark Hunt in the main event of a title fight, I would have thought you were Willy Wonka high on chocolate meth. It was just insane. I could not have pictured a more ridiculous type of finish. I mean, oh, just wow. I yeah, mean, that just shows you. Where Mark Hunt knocked for Fabrizio Overdoom down twice. Yeah, I mean. What was even more impressive was you see that that's that's the pace Mark Hunt was supposed to, supposed to fight at. He's at high elevation. He doesn't have the best cardio. It's been proven. While he can fight through it, it would not have helped him against a guy like Verdum in the later rounds. But he was pacing himself. He was he was he was countering when he needed to. If Fabricio came in, he has those dangerous fast hands. You don't expect a guy his size to really have fast hands, but he does. Fast, powerful hands. Um, was was get even dared to get on top of the guy in his guard and put some hands on him. It was insane, um, and it's just wow. It, it was it was a uh, it was definitely one of the highlights of the year. One of the one of the best knockouts of the year, I would say. Um, and it, it really just shows that Verdum is on a roll like no other because now he's five and zero in the UFC since he's returned. Uh, in, in his second run now, he has legitimately just put put it down as put himself down as he's the best guy right now. I think he surpassed JDS with that performance. Whatever you want to say, if JD because JDS has knocked Verdum out before, Verdum has made necessary changes in his career, in his fighting style, in everything, and and it's yep. the reason why he's at the top. I think if there was a fight between JDS and, and Verdum, I wouldn't count out Verdum. The, the man has made the necessary changes. And many people are saying, okay, JDS knocked him out, da, da, da. That was five years ago. Um, yeah. A long time yeah, ago. There's been s- pain, and we saw how that went down in the rematches. Exactly. I mean, there's been so much change yeah. to Verdum that we, we, have to, we have to realize that he is a legit fight for Kane. Now, I will say this. If Kane was fighting him in the first round of that fight, Verdum would have been in trouble. <laughs> because he wasn't moving around a lot, he wasn't, you know. Tra- yeah. I mean, and you need to with Kane. I mean, you need to be able to fight at his pace. Likes a days ago going into that first round. Yeah, and I don't know if that was because he was trying to be careful because of a guy like Mark Hunt. Maybe he also, at the same time, he also thinking about it um, because he knows Mark Hunt isn't the kind of guy to like, you know, show fancy footwork on you and, and come in and, and and he's a guy that blitzes you and you just got to be ready for the blitz. You know, so he didn't have to move around too much. I mean, he just needed to stay on the outside and yeah. prepare to be hit when, it, or prepare for the punch to come and then get out of the way. And he did. And so I think everything he could have done right, he did. Um, as far as on the defense, and then sure enough, lands the the most unsuspecting strike of the entire fight. Um, it was a wild, wild, wild main event, and at the and it capped off what, while maybe not talent wise the most talent stacked card it was an exciting card it was a fun card probably the most exciting of the night um and and wow and i can't see i can't wait to see i'm more excited i was already excited to see verdum fight kane because he presents a different type of challenge for kane than he's fought before 
But now I'm even more excited. He's he's cemented himself as the clear number two guy right now. JDS has been out for a while. And so with that, he steps in at number one for me right now. In the rankings, at heavyweight. And I can't wait to see this fight go down. Yeah, I mean, can Verdun beat Kane? Yes, of course he can. But will he? I don't see him beating a healthy Kane Velasquez. Yeah. I don't either. Uh, Kane Velasquez is just, he's, he's more of a complete fighter. I like using that term tonight, I guess. But yeah, Cain Velasquez is by far the most complete uh, fighter at heavyweight right now. True. Verdun's got his cut out for him. He I'm does. I'm not going to count him out. Uh, he, I'd say he has a better chance than JDS did in the last two matches he went into with uh, Kane. But Kane is just, he's too strong. He's too heavy when he's on top. And he hits way too hard. He has no problems putting people away when he's got them down. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Ends up getting... If Verdun gets mauled and gets uh, ends up under Kane, it's it's going to be over. It, that fight is going to end in a TKO if Kane gets on top. I mean, I agree, but I think the only way Verdun wins that fight is by submission. I don't see him beating be in. I mean, he could always clip Kane with something big, but yeah. I don't see him beating him that way. I think he, if he doesn't submit Kane, he's not going to win that fight. Not gonna win the fight. You never know. I mean, nobody would have seen him knocking out Mark Hunt. I mean, anything can happen, but at the same time, it is probably the least likely option in that fight, as it was in this fight. But you never know <laughs> in this crazy exactly. sport. Exactly, especially at heavyweight. You never know. These guys are big guys. They can finish, hit hard, they can finish man. anyone in that division. These guys are savages. Well, with that, guys, I think it's uh, appropriate to close it out right here. We'll definitely be bringing you more podcasts as we come along, fight fans. Um, Chris Pabucho, I want to say thank you again for uh, giving us an opening here for MMA discussion to get our podcast up and running again. We appreciate you. Jonas, I'm glad we popped your cherry tonight. It was awesome. (laughs) No problem, man. I mean, and for everyone who wants to listen to this, it's going to be up on the MMA discussion YouTube page. And, also, it's going to be on the site under podcast at sportsofanarchy.com. So, yeah, go follow us on Twitter at Sports of Anarchy and on Facebook. And you can see everything there. We'll have the podcast posted for you guys soon. Uh, anyone who wants to follow me, Nick Peralta, I'm uh, at Nick the Phantom at Twitter handle. Um, you can also follow me on uh, – follow the MMA Discussion uh, Facebook page. For everybody that doesn't know, at the moment we're having issues as well as the page has been uh, has been cited or flagged or something, hacked. We're trying to figure it out, but we'll get it back. I'm telling you, we're going to get it back. Uh, for all of the faithful fans, thanks for listening. Uh, Nick Peralta, Chris Bogusha, and Jonas Peterman signing out.